Ooh, tune gear. It's magically going to transform my sterile, bland, boring signal into a glorious treasure tone. With tube emulators being featured on digital consoles like Allen & Heath, SSL, and Digico, it's tempting to put it on every channel and just magically think that your whole mix is going to get a lot better. But what's this tube processor actually doing, and when should you use it? Today we're going to find out. Hey, if you're new here, go ahead and hit subscribe and ding the little bell to get notified every time I post a new video. I'm here to help you make every worship mix an enjoyable one. A clean amplifier puts out what you put in, and that's great. If you like boring, tube amplifiers are clean to a certain point, but as you drive them harder, they change the signal in two distinct ways. The first is harmonic distortion, and the second one is saturation. Now, as the tube amplifier reaches the end of its clean dynamic range, it's going to add a little bit of subtle harmonic distortion with even harmonics. These sound a lot better than odd harmonics, which is what you get from solid state distortion. What that gives us is a signal that feels warm and round. The other thing that the tube does is saturation. It's basically rounding off some of the high level transients and it boosts the RMS level compared to the peak level. If it's a good emulation, it won't affect the lower level transients, only the higher level ones. Side note, you have to be careful when comparing the sound of the processor in and out because your ears are going to automatically think that louder is better. So if you're comparing whether or not you like a processor, make sure that you're listening at the same average level for when it's in and when it's out. Because when it's all said and done, you're going to use the fader to adjust the level anyway. So I love the tube emulator on the bass guitar. The bass really gets helped out by having those extra overtones. And it's kind of reverse engineering what your ear does, because your ear will add in the fundamental when it hears the overtones. So when you add in the overtones, it sounds like you're boosting the fundamental. It can be a big help in making your bass feel bigger, even if your room is sub-challenged. The saturation is also really nice for adding a little bit of sustain. The next place where the tube emulator really shines is on acoustic guitars. I'm not so much looking for the harmonic distortion as much as I am for the saturation. I want to round off those transients so that when I push it up, it doesn't get painful, especially with a whole lot of pick click. As an added bonus, you can push up the high end to get some more shimmer out of the strings without the pick click getting louder too. While those are my go-to for putting on the tube emulator, it really can help on any other input that you have that just needs a little bit of warmth or rounding off some of the transients. But I don't put it on everything, because when I'm mixing, I'm trying to think about contrasts. Some things are bright, some things are dark, some things have a lot of transients, some things have less transients. So I'm trying to balance and blend those when I'm putting all the things together in my mix. Now vocals could be a great option, or it could destroy them. Our ears are really tuned in to how a vocal sounds, so when something sounds off, it can be a distraction. And we don't want to distract anybody when we're at church. So the tube emulator can be helpful for warming it up, but it could also be a distraction if it gets too distorted. And whether or not that's cool depends a lot on your musical style. Today's drink of the day is coffee. I've got beans from Parisi, which are sourced from Bolivia and organic. It's a medium roast, and it is delicious. It's earthy, with hints of cocoa and caramel, and it doesn't have any of that nasty fruity flavor. If I want something fruity or sour, I'm gonna get lemonade from Chick-fil-A with the number one. Now, when we're putting our mix together, there's a whole lot that demands our attention, so it can be easy to forget about the tube emulator button. So how do you know what to listen for if you've gone too far and done too much? One clue is if things sound mushy or smeared, you might need to dial it back or dial it back on the number of things that it's on. If you find yourself trying to unsuccessfully cut a lot of low end, that might mean that your tube emulator has driven a little bit too much. On the flip side, you might be missing the transients. So maybe you put it on your snare drum and it sounded cool for a minute, but then in the full mix, it's losing that attack. If all your compression and EQ isn't working to get that smack back, try bypassing the tube emulator. As with any processor that you're learning, try to understand what it sounds like when it's gone too far and when it doesn't have enough on it. That way you can dial in and find that sweet spot where it really works its best. Try it during virtual sound check or rehearsal, but don't play with it in the middle of the service. You don't want to be a distraction to everybody when it goes haywire. Now let's listen to some examples.
You have won me, won my heart over and over, and I won't hold it back. Oh, my love, oh, my love for you. So you can see it was really obvious on the master bus. When I turned on the tube mode, the level jumped up by about 4 dB. So to compare it, I had to turn down the output gain, and instead of turning on and off the tube mode, I would bypass the entire compressor. You 